Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. So the rumors of my demise are greatly exaggerated. Uh, what happened, just to update everybody, I'm, I'm sorry that I didn't do updates as to what was going on, but my PC, my main PC was down, and I just uh, was involved in getting my office rearranged. The reason why you hear the roar in the background that you're hearing is because I have... Uh, my main PC which has dual high-end GTX video cards it's in the room with me I'm gonna to have to find a solution to that which means um, isolating the sound somehow so bear with me on that that's the reason why I've been away so this is the silver chart that we're currently looking at uh, the weekly chart and the lines I've drawn in here are the current support and resistance lines. You can see we're very close to support. We'll just call it $18. $18 being the bottom of the range and roughly $22, just 18 to 22. Now the first thing I want to point out here, I want you to notice, is that the top of the range that we're at right now is that $21 Bear Stearns 2008 price and if you just think about how things have changed since 2008 that's more than eight years ago when that price was put in how much has changed since then as far as government finances as far as the deficit we're gonna look at the debt to the penny here in a second but things have changed dramatically as far as Fed intervention in the money supply and government spending and everything else but you can see that silver is still fighting to get through that area now I said before that that area was going to be a significant test because there was a lot of churning that went on you can see the period that I always point out here is this period here from roughly uh, mid 2013 through late 2014 where we were in that price range 18 to 22 so you can see we spiked up right up to the top of that range. We did not get a breakout. You can see we did not break out above the Bear Stearns top. But now we're consolidating. And the other big takeaway from this you can see here is this critical MACD crossover. Uh, it's not the most bearish of crossovers because you can see it's kind of uh, I really can't put a technical term on it, but it, I would say it's a hesitant crossover. It's one of those that can actually reverse course. You can see something like that here. But uh, it is a crossover and it could portend a serious down move. That would be excellent for everyone who is totally convinced of the fundamentals of silver. That's a topic that's come up recently. I'm going to address that in another video, but not tonight, of whether or not they've permanently capped silver. I don't think they have. I don't think that they can repeal reality. They can repeal markets. They've done more than anybody could have guessed that they, they could do. But again, I don't think that they have repealed the fundamentals of reality and markets so before we look at the debt to the penny thing I want to uh, jump over to cryptocurrencies and just update you on what I'm doing with those I've pretty much been flat on those I do most of my trading on Poloniex that is the go-to exchange now a big caveat for anybody who's trading cryptocurrencies we saw with the shutdown of Cripsy and many many others in the past that it's a very dangerous thing to play in these markets if you're going to leave your coins on the exchange for an extended period of time because the the exchange can shut down so I wanted to show you my current position this is the coin that I am involved with let's say and uh, it's based on purely a technical move I don't have a lot of knowledge of the coin it's a clam coin I have a significant position in this coin I'll show you why on the short term so this is a coin that 
I always look for something that has had a significant breakout on very, very large volume. And ideally, you want to buy the coin right when it's breaking out, but that's not always the easiest thing to do. So the second best thing you can do when you're talking about getting in on some type of bull move is to pick it up after it corrects. So you can see here, this is actually a, a, a very violent correction on this coin. It had a massive volume rally from about, we'll say 0.001 to uh, 0.002 something, uh, a doubling or tripling roughly, uh, if, you, if you get to the closest uh, in the minute charts, it roughly tripled. So if we look out to the long-term chart, you can see the, the big takeaway here is this volume spike here. It is an unprecedented volume spike. You can see in the past, this little volume ran the coin, maybe a five-fold move. This was selling volume. This volume ran the coin a two-fold move. So what I'm banking on is that this interest, this volume coming into the coin, is going to be rewarding. So, like I said, I I don't have the biggest position in the coin, and the position that I took was uh, basically at the low end of this correction. I did not get in right there, which would be the ideal point, but I did kind of average in. So we'll see how that goes. Again, this is a very dangerous thing for people to do. It, it's just something that you do with your play money. Do not risk any serious money on this. The other coin I'm watching really carefully here is Steam. I think a lot of you know about this. It's, it's kind of an alt media cryptocurrency. And the rule of thumb with cryptocurrencies is that they always start with a massive rally and then they sell off. And, and the big issue is going to be, can you pick the bottom? Now, I'm sure there were a lot of people right here on this volume spike. You can see when you put your mouse pointer over that, you can see that the volume of Bitcoin on that spike was 1,745 Bitcoins made that volume spike. This spike here was 716 Bitcoins. This spike here, 968 Bitcoins. This one... Uh, about 358 Bitcoin. So we haven't seen the type of volume spike that we're looking for that would exceed. You really want to see something that probably exceeds the original. And you can see the very original trading of this was 2,700 Bitcoins. So it's very, very difficult and dangerous to try to pick a bottom in these cryptocurrencies. But if you actually get the bottom or average into the bottom, you can make phenomenal gains. So that's buyer beware. So let's get over to the debt to the penny. Now we're going to look at this election issue and I'm fairly well convinced at this point that it's going to be a Trump presidency. But uh, let's, let's look at the debt to the penny. Trump has been talking about the fact that Obama basically doubled the national debt, which his predecessor did, and his predecessor did as well. Uh, so they're never going to tell you the truth about the national debt. It, it's always going up. It's always gone up. They're going to tell you that Clinton reduced it. That's a lie. No one has ever reduced it. It's always gone up. You can see our yearly average when we look back one year ago today we've got 18.151 trillion a year ago from today and we're at 19,508. so we're getting very very close to that 1.5 trillion dollar deficit an ongoing deficit every single year of 1.5 trillion and that's with the interest rates the way they are and with the federal reserve with what it's doing that's 1.5 trillion dollars of printed money that the Fed is printing and buying the debt of the US government. How long can that last? Who knows? But at some point it's going to end and it's going to be very, very ugly when it ends. Now I want to play you a video that is was originally linked on Zero Hedge 
and this is about the Hillary Clinton thing. Now, what is going on with Hil Hillary Clinton is craziness. I'm not going to go way deep into the conspiracy stuff. I'm sure a lot of you are aware that there are rumors of Hillary dying. There are rumors of body doubles. There are all kinds of crazy rumors. This is something that was posted today where this congressman is challenging uh, a representative of the FBI who ultimately speaks for Comey, who's the head of the FBI. And this is a pretty heated confrontation here. So I'm going to play this and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Trump and Hillary. What does Congress not have the right to see? So I don't know if I can answer that in a way that uh, uh, you know, I think there's more to it than a simple answer. No, 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 no. Wait, wait, wait. I'm asking you a philosophical question here. What does Congress not have the right to see? I think that each case is um, sort of specific to its own set of facts. I think we tried to be, I think Director Comey tried to be as transparent as he could with this committee. Do you think he could be? Other, okay. other committees as he responsibly can be. So I think when he spoke and he answered questions. Wait, wait, what, what is it that I as a member of Congress or any member on this Congress, either side of the aisle, what is it that you believe we don't have the right to see? See, this is the way our, our government works. We get to do oversight. That's why since 1814 this committee has been doing that. There's executive privilege. Let me help you. There's executive privilege. Has the president invoked executive privilege in this case? No. The answer is no. Good. That's right. The answer is no. Is there any other situation? Look, when it comes to classified information and the classification that, that deals in the executive order, you know, not all the information that we have in our files belongs to us. We defer to other agencies when it comes to access to their classified information. But you are the ones that put redactions on personal identifiable information, correct? We did on the personal identifiable information, that's correct. Where in the Constitution does it say that I can't see that? Does it address it specifically in the Constitution? So. Can you cite any legal case, any precedent that says that Congress can't look at personal identifiable information? I cannot cite any legal case. Did, um, are you aware that Congress is exempt from the Privacy Act? I am. Does the FBI treat congressional document requests as FOIA requests? No. Will the FBI provide Congress all of the 302s? All of the 302s, uh, we have one set that you've been provided already. The rest of them are coming through the FOIA process. Wait, wait, wait. Yep. We're not, we, <laughs> FOIA process? You mean I got to right. fill out a FOIA request? You can. <laughs> <laughs> not necessary. When? Uh, I th here, here's the problem. You handpicked the 302s to give to us. My understanding of discussion with staff, and I appreciate your accessibility with the staff. You, you've been good, and you're new. And I, for your first time hearing, this is a tough one, but the reality is you should give us all the 302s. So let me say this. I think that uh, I think the director made principal decisions about what to say to Congress when he was here and also what to provide to Congress. As far as the... the Wait, where do I find that? Personally identifiable. Do we just let everybody in government decide that they're based on their own individual principles? That's what Congress... See... It's trust but verify is how it works. You don't get to decide what I get to see. I get to see it all. I was elected by some 800,000 people to come to Congress and see classified information. I was elected by my colleagues here to be the chairman of this committee. That's the way our Constitution works. Will the FBI provide to Congress the full file with no redactions of personal identifiable information? I cannot make that commitment sitting here today. Then I'm going to issue a subpoena, and I'm going to do it right now. So let's go. I've signed this subpoena. We want all the 302s, and we would like the full file. You can accept service on behalf of the FBI? Certainly. You are hereby served. We have a duty and a responsibility. You can cite no precedent, nothing in the Constitution, no legal precedent, you know this is important to us. You now have your subpoena. We would all like to see this information. 
Wow, I think that guy, uh, I think some commenters have said that uh, he better stay away from nail guns. So I'm going to be on the record here, and I've said it before, that Trump is going to win. Uh, I don't know what that means. I'm not really sure which factions are doing this. I think the Clintons are finished. Um, I don't know if the Clintons are a Bush faction, the last of the Bush faction, or if Obama is the last of the Bush faction, or if, in fact, perhaps that Donald Trump is still part of the Bush faction. I don't know. Something is changing. I do believe I am 95% convinced now that Trump is going to win this election. So here's the big question. What is that going to mean? Now, this is an article from Michael Snyder, Economic Collapse blog. And I've already shared with you what I think about Michael Snyder and his uh, constructionist Christian um, dominionist types of positions. I certainly don't agree with him anything about Christianity. But uh, let's take a look at this article of what Donald Trump would do. Now, we know the politicians never do what they say they're going to do. That's the nature of politicians. But even if some of these happen, there's going to be some serious changes. This is 10 things that every American should know about Donald Trump's plan to save the U.S. economy. I'm going to comment on these uh, points. Can Donald Trump turn the U.S. economy around? This week, Trump unveiled details of his new economic plan, and the mainstream media is having a feed field day criticizing it. But the truth is that we simply cannot afford to stay on the same path that Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, and the Democrats have us on right now. Millions of jobs are being shipped out of the country. The middle class is dying. Poverty is exploding. Millions of children in America don't have enough food. And our reckless spending has created the biggest debt bubble in the history of the planet. Something must be done or else we will continue to steamroll towards economic oblivion. So is Donald Trump the man for the hour? If you would like to read the his full economic plan, you can find it on his official campaign website. His plan starts off by pointing out that this has been the weakest economic recovery since the Great Depression. Last week's GDP report showed that the economy grew more grew a mere 1.2% in the second quarter and 1.2% over the last year. It's the weakest recovery since the Great Depression, the predictable consequence of massive taxation, regulation, one-sided trade deals, and onerous energy restrictions. And Trump is exactly right about how weak this economic recovery has been. So how would he fix things? The following are 10 things that every American should know about Donald Trump's plan to save the U.S. economy. Number one, Donald Trump would lower taxes on the middle class. The tax savings under Trump's plan would actually be quite substantial for the middle class families. Following numbers coming from a recent Charisma article, a married couple earning $50,000 per year with two children and $8,000 in child care expenses will save 35% from their current tax bill. A married couple earning $75,000 per year with two children and $10,000 in child care expenses will receive a 30% reduction in their tax bill. A married couple earning $5 million per year with two children and $12,000 in child care expenses will get a 3% reduction in their tax bill. Uh, I'm not going to comment about child care and what a mess that is. Uh, but starting off, that's not much of a change. It, it's kind of reminiscent of Reagan, but we'll see. Number two, Donald Trump would lower taxes on businesses. Under his plan, no business in America would be taxed more than 15%. Alternatively, Hillary Clinton's plan would tax some small businesses at a rate of close to 50%. So Trump's plan would undoubtedly be good for business and it would encourage many that have left the country to return. But where would the lost tax revenue be made up? I don't think it's going to encourage anybody who's left to return. Number three, child care expenses would be exempt from taxation for working families with children. This would be a great blessing. Without a doubt, this is an effort to win over more working women. And this is a demographic that Trump has been struggling with. It is definitely an idea that I support. But once again, where will the money come from to pay for this? I don't support this at all. 
I think that the entire child care industry and the concept of having both parents work and then having strangers raise your children is one of the most destructive ideas that's ever come down the pike. Uh, obviously, I'm a Christian, and I believe that a man's job is to work and support his family, and a woman's job is to raise the children and tend to the home, and uh, this is going in the exact opposite direction. I'll, that's all I'll say on that. Number four, U.S. manufacturers will be allowed to immediately fully expense new plants and equipment. This would undoubtedly lead to a boom in capital investment, but it would also reduce tax revenue as an emergency measure, this would be very good for encouraging manufacturers to stay in America, but would also likely increase the budget deficit. So that's three points in a row now where we're talking about the deficit increasing. Now, I personally do not believe that manufacturers uh, would begin a boom in capital investment just because they reduce taxes. There's a lot more to this than just the tax issue. There's the currency issue. Uh, there's jobs issue, there's trained uh, people issue. Uh, it's not that simple. Number five, a temporary freeze on new regulations. Red tape is one of my big pet peeves, and so I greatly applaud Trump for this proposal. I think that Bob Eshleman put it very well when he wrote the following about Trump's plan to freeze new regulations. In 2015 alone, federal agencies issued over 3,300 final rules and regulations, up from 2,400 the prior year. Studies show that small manufacturers face more than three times the burden of the average U.S. business, and the hidden tax from ineffective regulations amounts to nearly $15,000 per U.S. household annually. Excessive regulation is costing our country as much as $2 trillion per year, and Trump will end it. Well, I don't think Trump will end it, but uh, what needs to be done is much, much more drastic than what's proposed here. Uh, I would say they need to repeal 99% of all the um, uh, regulations that the government has. And I would suggest that they cut the government workforce in half and perhaps cut it in half again and reduce their pay by 50%. And that would be a 7-8 savings right there. We're not seeing any kind of proposals like that here. This is much more reminiscent of Reagan, and you know how that turned out. Number six, all existing regulations would be reviewed and unnecessary regulations would be eliminated. We've already talked about that. Number seven, Donald Trump would fundamentally alter our trade relationships with the rest of the globe. Donald Trump is the first major party nominee in decades to recognize that our trade deficit is absolutely killing our economy. I agree with that 100%. I write about this all the time. and It's a hot button issue for me, so I definitely applaud Trump for proposing the following. Appoint trade negotiators whose goal will be will be to win for America, narrowing our trade deficit, increasing domestic production, and getting a fair deal for our workers. I, that is just a bunch of boilerplate. Again, you have to deal with the currency. You have to deal with the deficit. You have to deal with government spending. The deficit, government spending, and the trade deficit, and the value of the currency, all of those things are connected. You can't fix one w without fixing the rest. You have to fix them all. Renegotiate NAFTA, withdraw from the TPP, bring trade relief cases to the World Trade Organization, label China as a currency manipulator, apply tariffs and duties to the countries that cheat, direct the Commerce Department to use all legal tools to respond to trade violations. I've already talked about this. It's not the fact that America is being cheated with the trade rules. Yes, there are some egregious violations. I personally find the HB1 ver worker visa um, a terrible thing, and there's a lot of other things. But at the same time, the basic reason why we are being beaten by the Chinese right now, and in the past it was the Japanese, is because of regulations, taxes, the quality of workers that we have, and a whole bunch of reasons that aren't going to be fixed by throwing tariffs onto imports. That's just going to cause a trade war. It's going to cause much, much higher prices in Walmart and for everything that Americans buy. So 
I, I couldn't disagree more with that point. Number eight, Donald Trump's plan would be a tremendous boost for the U.S. energy industry. Barack Obama promised to kill the coal industry. It's one of the few promises that he actually kept. Obama also killed the Keystone Pipeline. Right now, the energy industry as a whole is ending their worst stretch since the last recession. I'm not going to read the rest of this. Um, energy is a non-issue for me. We have a glut right now. We have a glut of oil. We have a glut of energy. And it's actually being artificially propped up. Uh, I don't believe any of the stories that they tell you about peak oil. There's a lot of people still talking about peak oil. To me, it's absolutely ridiculous and absurd. Number nine, Trump would repeal Obamacare. Trump claims that Obamacare would cost our economy 2 million jobs over the next 10 years, and without a doubt, it has already cost the U.S. economy a lot of jobs. Not only that, but Obamacare has also sent health insurance premiums soaring. This is putting a tremendous amount of financial pressure on many families. Trump says that he would replace Obamacare, but that is a rather vague statement. What exactly would he replace it with? Well, that's very, very weak. We already know what's wrong with our medical system in this country. There is no competition. And you, there are already people who are taking medical vacations overseas, whether they're going to Thailand or Mexico, Mexico to get their dental work done, Thailand to get their surgical work done. We have the worst possible system that we that is even imaginable currently in the US and the Obamacare bill basically just gave more power to the insurance companies to gouge it is the worst system you can possibly imagine I don't really see anything here that is talking about a free market solution that's very discouraging to me number 10 Trump's plan says nothing about the Federal Reserve this is a great concern because the Federal Reserve has far more power over the economy than anyone else so I'm not going to read the rest of that, but Trump has come out and publicly criticized the Federal Reserve. Now, it was mainly to criticize them for keeping the current administration in a good economic light. And uh, But as far as coming out and saying things like Reagan said, if you remember, if you were around during that election, Ronald Reagan was criticizing the CFR. He was criticizing the Trilateral Commission. He sounded pretty much like a John Birch Society guy when he was campaigning and getting all that momentum. We're not hearing anything like that from Trump. So I do believe that Trump is going to win the election. Uh, I'm not too encouraged by the things that are in his platform and even the things that are good in his platform there really aren't that many things that are good in his platform but even those things that are good he'll probably back off from those things so as I've said in the past I believe firmly that we are on a course that is going to run the train off the tracks I don't think there's anybody that can reverse it uh, it's probably most likely that Trump is going to be painted as a conservative and he's going to get the blame for whatever really bad things happen in the economy when he wins. I do believe he's going to win. I believe there's a 95% that Trump is going to win. And we'll talk to you next time.